We're talking today with Dr. Edward Bird of Mount Pleasant, South Carolina, and the interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. Now, can you begin with some background on yourself, and to begin with, uh, where and when were you born? I was born January 26, 1940 in Birmingham, Alabama. And did you grow up there or move around? No. Um, my parents uh, struggled financially in Alabama. It was still, at that time, the Depression was still having an effect there. So they moved to Washington, D.C. when I was one year old, and I spent uh, almost my whole youth in Washington with a, with a few breaks, but uh, grew up mostly in Washington, D.C. Okay. And what did your family do for a living while you were growing up? Uh, my dad tried uh, several businesses, and the, his most successful one was to start a school for returning veterans from World War II. The, the government uh, gave him money to run a, uh, uh, an air conditioning school where he could teach the veterans how to repair air conditioning units, refrigeration units, and he was successful at that for a while. Um, my mother worked for the uh, federal government at different agencies. She was with the Commerce Department and later with the General Accounting Office. Okay. Uh, and where did you go to high school? I went to Calvin Coolidge High School in Washington, D.C. Graduated in 58. Okay. Uh, and what did you do once you finished high school? I was lucky enough to have won a scholarship to George Washington University, which is also in Washington, D.C., and my parents didn't have very much money, so that was a godsend to our family. So I went to George Washington undergraduate school, mm -hmm. and uh, I majored in zoology because uh, that dealt with anatomy, and I, by then I was pretty sure I wanted to go to medical school. Okay. Now, while you're, let's see, you're there, so let's see, that's like 58 to 62, roughly, or? Uh, actually, they had what they call a combined degree program. They were trying to shorten the length of time that it took to do your undergraduate and medical school. So I got in after three years if, if you did mm -hmm. well enough on your uh, medical college admission test. They'd take you after three. So actually it was seven years for me undergraduate and four years in medical school. Okay. Now during the time that you're uh, in, in school, first in undergrad and the medical school, that's a period sort of between wars, but there was still a Cold War going on, there was still a draft going on. Uh, did you have a deferment the whole time you were in school, or how did that work? I guess I did, because I, when I was 18 and a half, I think I had to register for mm -hmm. selective service. So uh, I, I suppose I did have a deferment, but um, uh, because the war was ramping up. I, I graduated from medical school in 65, and we were beginning to get into Vietnam in yep. a pretty big way by then. Uh, uh, one day in medical school, a uh, army officer with a lot of <laughs> ribbons on his chest uh, uh, called a conference and said, "You, all you guys, and, and women too, um, are going to do two years in uh, service to your country. And it, most of you it'll be military service, there may be some other ways you can do it, but uh, all of you are going to have a two-year break in your education for that. And That was when I first realized that the war was going to affect me personally. Okay. Had you paid much attention to what was going on in the world otherwise? or I had. I, uh, I had a strange thing happen. When I was a kid and the Second World War was going on, uh, I encountered a, a magazine that, that had a full-page color picture of a wounded soldier in which half of his whole body was covered with blood, and he was holding his arm like this, appealing to people to donate blood for the soldiers. Mm -hmm. And that so shocked me I, I, to my uh, youthful way of thinking. I, I didn't understand the war involved anything like that. I, I was so frightened and shocked that uh, from that moment on, I, I lived in dread of having anything to do with war. And so uh, Korea came on a few years later, and uh, I was too young to have to worry about that. But then in medical school, things, uh, first we started sending advisors to Vietnam, and then some combat troops, and then uh, and large numbers of troops. And uh, the timing was such when this officer said, you guys are going to be going into the military, it looked like I probably was going to uh, going to be involved in war in some way. All right. So, uh, uh, 
Then how how long was was that right toward the very end of med school when that happened or? Yeah, <coughs> pardon me. Um, yeah, so I remember the Washington Post. <coughs> I'm sorry. Had a big picture on the front page one day. This was probably in '64 when we started bombing uh, Hanoi, mm -hmm. and sure, there was black clouds of smoke building up over Hanoi. And everybody understood that was a big escalation. It had not gotten to that point until then, and that this meant things were getting pretty serious. There's going to be a lot of people involved in this conflict, and that was uh, that was when I started getting uh, a little concerned. Okay, uh, so you now once okay, you know okay, you're going to have to go and serve. Do they give you choices or options about how that would happen? They did. They had a what they called a berry program, and they gave us uh, three options. In one program, I could graduate from medical school, do a year of internship, and then go in as a lieutenant, which is what I did, lieutenant in the medical corps. Uh, the second option was you could do medical school, your internship, and one year of specialty, and go in as a less than completely trained specialist. And uh, the final option was you did your, you completed your specialty in training, your residency in whatever specialty that might be, and then you went in as, as a higher ranked officer at that time. But I didn't do that. I went in as a, right after my internship when I wasn't, was not trained in my specialty. Okay. And why did you make that choice? Because I was undecided as to what uh, my specialty, what I wanted to do, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I wasn't ready to make a decision, so I thought, well, I might as well do this and get it out of the way. All right. Uh, and, and so when do you have to report for duty then? Um, I'm not sure I understand. Well, you, you finish your, your your medical school training. Oh, and then they... And then they, they expect you to go into the service at some point. Do you enter the service right away after med school, oh, or is oh, that a break? Uh, or? Well, I, um, well, I did medical school and then my year of internship. Okay. And, uh, and uh, some months before your internship is over, they say, uh, report for duty at such and such a place. Uh, in my case, it was uh, eight days after I finished my uh, internship. Okay. So, and, and where did you do your internship? Uh, I did my medical school and uh, internship at George Washington University in Washington, D.C. Okay, so you just stayed there, you didn't go somewhere else for no. that? Okay. No. Uh, all right, so then you do the year of internship, and then where did they send you first? <laughs> it was interesting, they sent all uh, the new incoming Navy docs to the Naval Academy, where they uh, outfitted you with uh, uniforms and gave you some lessons in naval history, which I found very interesting, and um, taught you who was supposed to salute you and who you were supposed to salute. <laughs> and, 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 you know, kind of, it was a general orientation, I guess. And then finally you got your orders as to where you were to report. Now, about how long did you actually stay at the, at the Naval Academy? Two weeks. Okay. And did they march you around at all, or did they not even try that? No. Okay. So pretty basic orientation yes. to the Navy at, at that point. Yes. Okay, and your orders, and so now where do you go? I was ordered to report to the USS Truckee, which was a uh, called a fast fleet oiler, a large oiler. And the reason that I was assigned to an oiler was that the oiler um, was the uh, where the squadron commander of a squadron of ships uh, was, and. Um, so they wanted the medical officer to be uh, with the squadron commander. So uh, I uh, looked at the orders and it said you should report to the naval yard in Baltimore, Maryland. So I went there and uh, asked where the truckee was and they said, well, it's in dry dock. And uh, I had to, because oilers are mostly under the water because mm -hmm. they're a huge tank. <laughs> I had to climb way up these steps to get up to the uh, officer of the deck, and he admitted me to the ship, and I said, I'm uh, medical officer Bird reporting for duty. <laughs> they looked at me like I was out of my mind. <laughs> they were sandblasting the paint off the ship at night, in July, hot night in uh, Baltimore, and I said, well, you don't have anything for you to do here. So I said, well, okay, what do you want me to do? And they said, well, there's a, there's a ship down in Norfolk that's going to go out and picket duty. At that time, uh, the astronauts 
would parachute, uh, or, or their their capsules would land in the in the ocean, mm -hmm. and we'd have uh, ships every so many miles uh, spaced out to to pick up the astronauts, and there was going to be a launch. So I was uh, given temporary duty on a ship called the Chikaskia, which was an older, small uh, oiler, and. Uh, we were getting ready to steam out of uh, Norfolk, and uh, something went wrong with the engines, and we <laughs> turned around and never made it out there. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's when I learned that uh, in the military, a lot of things uh, <laughs> don't always turn out the way they're supposed to. Uh, so, they came back, and, um, and I guess I stayed on the Chikaskia for two or three months because it took that long for the Truckee to, to be finished uh, being refurbished. And then the Truckee came down to Norfolk and I went back on that ship. <clears throat> and then finally we went to the Mediterranean. Okay. Well, during the time then when you're, you know, at Norfolk and so forth, did you have anything to do? Or were there sick people to attend to once in a while uh, or anything? No, because there was a big naval hospital there in Norfolk mm -hmm. and they had all these clinics and uh, uh, the practice was to um, just send the sick people and injured people to the naval hospital because they could do all kinds of things that we couldn't do in a mm -hmm. ship like x-rays and blood tests. And so, uh, no, I, um, <coughs> excuse me. Played some golf. The uh, the line officers wanted me to learn how to take the watch at the helm of the ship, which I, <laughs> I resisted because I was pretty sure I would probably run into a, another ship or a reef, and I, I thought that was beyond my capabilities. I didn't want to do that. And uh, and and briefly, uh, they uh, they gave me temporary duty to another ship, a supply ship called the Altair. We went to the Mediterranean, and at that time, that was when the uh, um, one of the Arab-Israeli wars. This would have been in uh, sixty-seven, late, late in sixty-seven, yeah. and we were in the Mediterranean resupplying ships and got a call to go to Alexandria, Egypt, because um, it looked like the Israelis might get as far as Alexandria in this war and they were going to be fighting and shooting in Alexandria and we had a lot of American civilians so we were supposed to go there and, and pick up any Americans civilians that they could get out of Alexandria uh, and what interrupted that was that um, there was an American intelligence gathering ship that was attacked by the Israelis and shot up and a bunch of Americans were killed and then, so then we were told instead of going to Alexandria, go to that ship, and I forget the name of that ship, but uh, uh, it was a big problem between mm -hmm. us and the Israelis for a while. Um, we uh, were supposed to intercept the ship and, uh, and give them whatever medical supplies we had that they wanted. But then that didn't happen. I, I, think, we, I think we gave them some antibiotics or something mm -hmm. like that, but I... Uh, there was never any, they never gave us any casualties, and I don't remember even seeing the ship, so. so but it was a very confused time because uh, there was that war going on, nobody expected it, and, and then our ship got shot up. So I was on the ship in that area, and all these things were happening all the time, but uh, never got shot at, mm -hmm. anything like that. Now, on that Mediterranean cruise, did you stop any place, or did you just stay? Uh Let's see. Uh, our naval base, I think that was the Sixth Fleet in the Mediterranean, um, Sixth Fleet naval base was Naples, Italy. Mm -hmm. So we would put into Naples every week or so and uh, refuel and pick up supplies to transfer to the other ships. And, uh, and I got to uh, travel to some cities in uh, Italy while we were mm -hmm. in Naples. Did you have a sense of what kind of attitude the Italians had toward American servicemen at that time? or? Or they just I did, didn't have that much contact with them. Uh, I didn't speak Italian, mm -hmm. and when I traveled, uh, it, it, it was kind of difficult because of the language problem. I, I can't say that I really had a, any kind of in-depth conversation mm -hmm. with Italians. And, uh, 
Yeah, just in terms of how you got treated generally, did you just feel like another tourist at that point? Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, so about how long did you spend on that Mediterranean cruise? Oh, probably a month. Okay. It's not real long. Uh, and then is it back to Norfolk? Came back to Norfolk. Yeah. Okay. Now, did you ever actually then, then serve on the Truckee, or did you keep getting moved? Uh, yes, the Truckee uh, left Norfolk to go to um, the Mediterranean probably in uh, December or January of uh, January of 67 at that time. Well, if you had the, well, the Six Day War was in 67. So that's it the, was in 67. That's the Arab Israeli War, yeah. Okay, well, it was after that that we sailed. Okay. So, when so it, then it, that would have been January of 68. Would they get to that later? Were you in no, Vietnam yeah, by then? I was in Vietnam. Okay. Well, maybe that there were. There were multiple things that went on in, in, in the Middle East, or, or a crisis, but it was while you were on the Altair that they had that first incident? Yes, I, uh, maybe my memory is mixing up incidents here, but I, I, I remember we were supposed to go to Alexandria and pick up any civilians mm -hmm. they wanted to evacuate, and then I, I remember... Okay. Well, maybe, those are, those maybe are things, that happened yeah. in a later yeah. voyage, well, that, that might be the, a maybe when I was on the Truckee. That would probably work better chronologically. Okay, uh, then, I, then my my history is off. <laughs> so maybe you had a, 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 a short cruise on the Altair, came back, got on the Truckee, went back over. And then maybe maybe it was on the Truckee. Mm -hmm. But I, I remember we were supposed to give them many medical supplies mm -hmm. we had, so... Uh, uh, okay, now what's daily life like on one of these ships when you're out on one of these cruises? Well, for me, I guess the, the ship in the Mediterranean, the ship I was on the longest was the Truckee. It was mm -hmm. a, an oiler, and uh, uh, it was kind of boring for me because these are all young, healthy guys, mm -hmm. and a few of the officers were older, but they didn't have any medical problems. And somebody might break a finger or something like that, which is easily dealt with, but there was very little for me to do. So I bought a camera and I, and I would film the, operate, the ship's operations, which I thought were interesting. Uh, for example, refueling. I didn't understand that uh, when they refuel, the, the, the oiler would be steaming ahead and it would have a ship on at least one side, sometimes ships on both sides with ships lined up, you know, ready to take their place. And they would throw a bolo across the water to joining ship and then pull a rope across and then a winch would have, winch the big heavy uh, big uh, tubes that had the oil mm -hmm. that they pumped over and uh, get them hooked up and, and it, it was interesting and then they would uh, send supplies from our ship to their ship uh, by things that carried mm -hmm. things and, and, and it was surprising how much got spilled into the Mediterranean boxes and boxes of stuff and they just kept going. They didn't turn around and go back. We dumped a lot of stuff in the Mediterranean. It was floating around and I guess it washed up <laughs> different islands. <laughs> there was a lot of wastage there. But I, it was interesting to see uh, see that and see how things worked. And um, and they, they would have gunnery practice. The uh, oiler had some uh, some anti-aircraft guns uh, fore and aft, and uh, they would they would have uh, gunnery exercises where a, a little Cessna plane, <laughs> probably going about 80 miles an hour, would tow a windsock behind it, and they would try to shoot at the windsock, and they never came close to it. <laughs> I said, Lord, if a, if a jet came by, <laughs> we were goners. <laughs> yeah, not, not a good place to be. No, no, so th those guns were no defense whatsoever against a modern aircraft, but that, they were required to, to do that, and they, uh, they would throw uh, barrels, oil barrels, in the water and let them float out and uh, shoot them with the uh, guns. Uh, but. Uh, those ships were, were not really combatant ships, they, they were called auxiliary ships, mm -hmm. and they were mainly supply. They were supporting not active combatant ships mm -hmm. like a now, Did you ha learn anything sort of about the backgrounds of the other officers on, on these ships, or 
how they got there or if they joined the Navy to stay out of Vietnam or anything like that? Um, uh, the, they were a very interesting group of people. Uh, one officer had been in the Merchant Marine and he was very valued because he could shoot the stars, he could take a sextant and uh, they would, he would do that as the sun was below the horizon and the light was going down and you could start seeing the star positions. And that was a, a talent that apparently had been lost. They, they had what they called in a Loran system, you know, was, uh, they, they fixed their position in the middle of the ocean by uh, triangulating radio waves being mm -hmm. sent out from different points. And I'm sure that was quite accurate, but he, he would shoot the stars and calculate exactly where they were, and uh, everybody looked up to him for that. I, I thought it was impressive. That I guess that's how the mariners long, long mm -hmm. time ago found their way across the oceans. And um, he was an interesting uh, guy, a good storyteller, and a funny guy. And uh, so he was from the Merchant Marine, and I guess he was. Uh, I guess he had made the transition to the Navy. He was a lifer, I think. And there are there are a number of older officers who who uh, were career mm -hmm. uh, naval officers. I probably was the only short-term reservist on the okay. ship, and uh, um, I, I found them very interesting. They they were very up to date on what was going on in the world because it affected them, you know, mm -hmm. if there was a crisis somewhere they might have to go there. They were interesting to talk to and uh, they tended to be pretty uh, politically conservative and um, it was just an interesting guy. They were good guys. They, 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 uh, they were conscientious. They did their job as well as they could do it and, uh, and I liked them. I liked them a lot. Did you have much of an impression of, of the enlisted men, the ordinary sailors? Um, I had uh, a chief uh, corpsman and uh, a, uh, uh, another petty officer corpsman who were career, and then they had what's called a striker, which meant he, he was in another division of the ship but wanted to become a corpsman, so he was working in the medical department to uh, get experience to make that transition. So I had three guys under me and um, I respected them a lot. The chief had, had been in a, a corpsman in uh, Korea and had been in combat mm -hmm. a lot and uh, I, uh, I respected what he had been through and, and he, he knew the Navy very well and, uh, and you know, I never thought about military people before I went in the Navy, but I, I came to have a, a real respect for them because they, they took their job seriously. They, they thought they were doing important work, which they were, and uh, I, I think uh, it helped me grow up a little bit to be a little more responsible about things. Okay. So, uh, so how long did you spend then with the Truckee? Well, if we left in the middle of winter, which we did because we encountered a huge storm crossing the Atlantic, um, I left the Truckee in July of 67 mm -hmm. and, and came back to my parents' house and uh, had a month break before going to Vietnam. Now, the, uh, I was told the practice was that for the two-year reserve, such as I as I would do a year at sea and then you'd get a year stateside in some clinic somewhere. Mm -hmm. So I went back expecting to uh, to be in some Navy hospital somewhere and uh, I got a phone call from a neurosurgeon at George Washington University whom I knew socially mm -hmm. and he said, hey why don't you think about uh, going into neurosurgery? And his name was Dr. Ammerman, Harvey Ammerman, a really nice guy. And I said, oh, Dr. Hammerman, I, I think neurosurgeons are pretty overbearing and unpleasant people. <laughs> I don't want anything to do with them. He said, wait, do you feel that way about me? And I said, oh, no, you're a perfect human. He said, well, <laughs> so there are guys like me then, too. And he said, uh, and we would like to have you. 
And he said, uh, why don't you consider going to a hospital ship in Vietnam? It should be safe, and, uh, and you can assist the neurosurgeons there, and you can learn something about the specialty, and if you like it, uh, what you'd have to do is you have to come back here and you have to do a year of general surgery and then four years of neurosurgery, so it'd be making a five-year commitment, or six years counting uh, Vietnam. So. And he said, do you want to treat runny noses uh, in a <laughs> Navy clinic? I said, no. <laughs> so it, it was a good argument. I said, okay, but I, I'm going to have a problem because if I tell my parents I'm going to Vietnam. They, they will probably have me committed to an insane asylum. <laughs> so I said, I'm sure you can handle it. So I, I told my parents, and, and they said, oh, no. And I said, look, I'll, I'll be off the coast, out of range, and uh, I'll be safe. And I said, this is a terrible <laughs> idea. I said, it's an opportunity, and I want to take it. So I said, okay. My, my parents never gave me ultimatums. They, Mostly let me do what I wanted to, although they let me know they were very uh, concerned about it. All right. I've so always had the impression that the military kind of sent people where it felt like sending them. Did you have a little bit different status because you'd been at sea for that amount of time already, so they couldn't make you go to Vietnam anyway? Uh, I, I, I was not going to be sent to Vietnam, but there were not a lot of folks, especially doctors, volunteering to go to Vietnam, because, because most of the doctors were specialists, they trained, some of them had families, and even mm -hmm. had medical practices that they had to leave behind. So not very many of them volunteered to go uh, be a medical officer on a ship, so uh, they they were happy to okay. send me. So I, I said, you think you got a place for me? He said, oh yes, we do. Now, did they give you any kind of orientation or preparation for that duty before you went over? No. No, okay. So then, uh, how did you get out to the repose, and when does that happen? Flew out in August. I, I had about a, a month's shore leave mm -hmm. between the Mediterranean and the Pacific, and flew out in August. And I was flown. I was flown by commercial airline, and I, I flew into Tonsonet Airport in August. Got off the airplane and it was so hot. It was a very humid, sweltering kind of heat, and it had these very tall uh, palm trees everywhere. I mean, it was really a jungle climate, and it was so hot. And they said oh, we're taking you out to the Hotel Annapolis uh, for a navy. <laughs> so okay, I said okay. So they put me in a gave me a driver and some car drove me out, and um, driving through what was then called Saigon, now Ho Chi Minh City, uh, you could see the French influence. There were a lot of crumbling old buildings, French buildings. They hadn't been maintained very well, and uh, uh, it was very crowded and uh, full of people on uh, mopeds and all kinds of little motor scooters and small cars. And, and we got out to the so-called Hotel Annapolis, which was just a cinder block building. It had obviously been built in a few days. Mm -hmm. It was about a three-story building. And they let me out there. And I noticed there was a soldier on guard outside. He had a sort of a circular arrangement of sandbags up to about his chest. And he had a helmet on. He was holding an M16 and um, looking around. And I, I just didn't take too much notice of him, and I went in to my room, and I, I was going to stay there overnight and fly up to Da Nang, where the ship was, and the uh, guys in there said, hey, did you hear about that guy who had a car down front? And I said, no, what happened? He said, he was standing there, and the street was full of traffic, and a, uh, a Vietnamese guy with a, with a woman behind him in an Ao Dai, you know, those long, white, mm -hmm. flowing, very attractive uh, long white uh, gowns um, behind him on the motor scooter pulled up. The woman pulled out a 45, aimed at the guy's head, pulled the trigger, and it clicked. It didn't fire. And the guy didn't know what to do because if he had opened fire, you know, he might have killed mm -hmm. 10 civilians in the process. And they immediately drove off. 
And the, and the card was very rattled because I guess it dawned on him then that although he had a weapon, uh, <laughs> people were surrounded by children and, mm -hmm. and civilians. And, and, uh, and he said, a half an hour later, the same thing happened again. This guy and this woman came back. She put the 45 up at his head, pulled the trigger, and again it misfired, and again they drove off and didn't come back again. And by then, the <laughs> poor sentry was uh, really, really upset because I think it dawned on him he, w he was effectively defenseless, you know, unless he was willing to kill some other people in the crossfire. And I said, oh my goodness, this, is, this isn't good. And, um, and I, and I was talking to other officers there at, uh, at Saigon, and they said, we're going to wind this thing up in a few months. But it didn't sound like it, you know. It sounded like you couldn't tell who was on your side and who was trying to kill you. You couldn't look at it and tell. Uh, so I thought, this is, a, this is a problem. So they sent me, uh, they flew me up, I think by helicopter, from Saigon to Da Nang, and I got on the, the ship. and. Uh, Da Nang, and, and that was very interesting because I landed at the airport at the base there. I think they call it NSA, Naval Support Activity. They gave me a driver to drive me out to the dock where the ship was. And on the road, on both sides of the road, were these large wooden crates stacked up to maybe, it seemed like 10 or 15 feet high in my memory. I may be exaggerating, but on both sides of the road, so you felt like you were driving down a hallway. You couldn't see anything because they were closely stacked. And I said, what in the world is all this stuff? And I said, it's, it's material for the war. And it went on mile after mile after mile until we got to the dock. I, you know, it must have been between five and ten miles of that stuff. And it was the most astounding display of the stuff that mm -hmm. we sent over there. And it was sitting by the side of the road, all crated up, and it's like, how in the world can they tell what, where the stuff is that they want? I, I'm sure they had a technique for it, but uh, it, it was amazing that there was so much material there. And we, we invested so much in that, uh, that war. So anyway, I got to the ship and got on board the ship and reported for duty. And they said, um, I had taken a medical internship. I was thinking I was going to go into a medical specialty as opposed to a surgical specialty. Mm -hmm. So they said, we want you to treat tropical diseases. And they gave me a ward with uh, probably 25 beds. And uh, in the first part of my time on the ship, I, I was responsible for, for treating those, things, those cases, uh, both uh, military personnel and, and civilians and some children. And that was a very interesting experience. But I told them that the reason I had volunteered to come out was I wanted to assist the neurosurgeon and uh, learn about neurosurgery. And he said, well, you can do that too. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, although my primary duty at first was to take care of malaria and parasites and all the bugs that you can get in Vietnam, um, if a neurosurgeon says, hey, I need some help, I would I'd okay. go to help him. Now, uh, what could you actually do for people who had malaria in those days? Well, there, there are anti-malarial drugs that were pretty effective. Okay. And, uh, mo uh, and that was really a very satisfying part of my uh, medical life, was treating those dis diseases because they responded pretty well to uh, the medications. The problem was that when they went back to Vietnam, they were exposed to the mosquitoes and mm -hmm. the stuff in the water, again, they were going to get it again, but at least for a while you could uh, cure their illnesses and they felt better and they were healthier. For okay. a while. So, so there, were, there were very good treatments. And for so, so how was it that Vietnamese civilians wound up out there? I mean, you'd think that would be something that... Well, because a lot of the civilians were working for us, okay. uh, at least nominally, uh, <laughs> there was a concern that some of them were up at nighttime were also trying to blow us up. But mm -hmm. uh, we hired a lot of uh, uh, Vietnamese civilians, and uh, and I think Da Nang had a big uh, medical facility, and I it seemed to me that if 
if civilians showed up and said, you know, my child is sick, I, I think they probably took care of them mm -hmm. just to, for humanitarian yeah. reasons because they sent yeah. a lot of them out to us. Right? It just seems a little bit surprising that they would go that far with the civilian population. But, um, yeah, they did. Yeah. We, we treat a lot of civilians on the ship. Okay. And, and how did they respond to coming onto the ship? Was that kind of a very strange world for them as far as you could tell, or was it hard to get much of that sense? Uh, well, again, the language problem made it hard. We, we did have translators, and I could... Uh, uh, but to my uh, discredit, I, I, I can't say I really talked to them about it. I, I think when they felt sick, they thought, you know, if this is... The Americans have something here that can help me feel better, mm -hmm. you know, whatever I have to do, I'll do it. They, they seemed grateful. Mm -hmm. There were never any problems with them. And I think they were glad that somebody was trying to help them feel better. Okay. Uh, now, aside from malaria, what else did people come out with? Uh, there is a roundworm called Ascaris that uh, is in the water, and if you drink it, you they start growing in your intestines, and they're tapeworms and uh, amoebiasis, amoebas. They're in the water, and uh, and our guys, the military personnel, were supposed to uh, treat the water with chemicals to uh, kill those things. But the water didn't taste very good after they treated it, and uh, a lot of times they didn't, and so they uh, they would get these things. But uh, I would say the very great majority of them responded very well to treatment. I, I did see one patient that had a form of malaria called uh, cerebral malaria, where the brain is very inflamed and swells up, and, and he was a soldier and he died of that. But that was rare. Mm -hmm. I, that's the only one I saw. That was another doctor treated him. So uh, those were the kinds of things that you could okay. take care of. All right, and now you are also now starting to uh, help out with, with the neurosurgeons, all right? Uh, and I don't know, can you describe a little bit the nature of that experience or what you wound up getting to do over the course of your time there? Well, um, when a neurosurgeon's operating, say, on a brain injury, um, uh, to control bleeding, they have an instrument. It's, it's sort of like uh, tweezers that are electrified, and uh, he'd put the tweezers on a bleeding blood vessel, and my job would be to make an electric contact so that it would mm -hmm. coagulate the blood vessel. So I do that and hold retractors to hold things out of the way so he could get at what he was doing at. And maybe sew up the skin and do some simple things like mm -hmm. that. And uh, um, once uh, it became known among the other surgeons, the non-neurosurgeons, that I was looking for experience in the operating room, uh, they started asking me to help them in, in other specialty, general surgery mostly. Mm -hmm. And so I started, uh, you know, assisting with them. And uh, so a lot of my uh, time in the operating room was uh, non-neurosurgical cases too, but mostly neurosurgical. Mm -hmm. okay. And did this eventually become your, your principal job? Did they move you out of the medical part? Yes, after a while I, I spent all my time with the surgeons and they gave the, the medical side to somebody else because they, they knew my real reason there was to get some surgical experience. For You know, if I had decided to go into surgery, uh, I would have taken a surgical internship, not a medical internship, mm -hmm. but I, so I was behind in that and they were trying to help me uh, get caught up uh, with the surgical techniques and how uh, how to get around in the operating room. Uh, on a practical level, do you think being there on the hospital ship with all these combat wounds and so forth, did that speed up your education or did you learn things you wouldn't have learned back home? I think I did, but but you know, almost all the neurosurgical work was, was trauma. Mm -hmm. tra head wounds, spinal wounds, and um, Fortunately, in civilian life, that's not a big part. Well, I shouldn't say that because there are a lot of ac head mm -hmm. injuries from automobile accidents, but that's a different kind of yeah. trauma. The, the, the most destructive uh, head injuries in war are artillery fragments, which are traveling much, much faster than a bullet. So they'll, they'll go through a guy's helmet, his head, 
come out the helmet on the other side and hit another guy and do the same thing. They're very high velocity uh, missiles and they're very destructive and, and scrubbed on a lot of those. You, of course, you don't see anything like that in civilian life. Mm -hmm. Even a bullet wound um, to the head is not nearly as a high velocity as an artillery fragment. So it, it was. I got exposed to the general techniques of neurosurgery, but uh, fortunately it didn't have to treat those kinds of things in civilian life. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, and were most of the doctors there, were they people who had essentially been drafted, or were some of them lifers, or what was the mix there? Some of them were lifers, but I think most of them were not. Um, there was one guy, I think the draft uh, cutoff age was 35, I believe, at, at that time. And there was a general surgeon uh, from Missouri got drafted just a, a couple of months before his 35th birthday. He had a family, had a mortgage, had a medical practice, and he had to leave all that. And that, it was a real hardship for him because he, I, I, I suppose the banks maybe made some special provision for them he made less money in the Navy, mm -hmm. and it was probably hard for him to pay his mortgage and support his family, but, but he went out. And what was the attitude of most of the doctors toward the war, or what they were doing, or did they just focus on their job? Most of them did not want to be there. I doubt that any of them volunteered, and they, they were very skeptical that that it was a good policy for us to be there. They really, uh, it just didn't seem like things were moving in the right direction, especially after the Tet Offensive. That really affected uh, morale a lot. It, it, it was hard to see how this thing was going to end in any good way for the United States. So they, they did their duty, they were good doctors and, and cared about the the men that got hurt and did everything they could to help them, but they didn't want to be there. Mm -hmm. uh, did you have any, did you have corpsmen that you got to know at all or any of the other personnel? I, I did. When I when I had the medical unit at first, I had uh, several corpsmen and a, and, uh, and a nurse, a Navy nurse, who was the head nurse for that unit. and. Uh, we felt a very close relationship. We had a little family of, mm -hmm. of people there, and uh, I think uh, I think the military people have a natural affinity for combat guys that go out and get hurt, and mm -hmm. they want to do anything they can to help them. And yeah. there seems to be a natural sympathy between them, and uh, so we all got along well and liked each other, and, and didn't have any problems. Okay. All right, now you mentioned the Tet Offensive in passing, and you're, you're in Vietnam, and it includes that, starts at the end of January, start of February. Uh, you have your own Tet Offensive experience, though, right? I did. In, uh, sometime in January, uh, my commanding officer said, uh, we've got a load of uh, paraplegics and quadriplegics we're going to send back to Bethesda Naval Hospital, and we want a medical officer to be with them on the trip back. And uh, we want you to do that, and then when they've been uh, taken to Bethesda Naval, turn around and come back. I said, okay. So I was on that uh, flight back to Bethesda Naval, uh, which by coincidence was very near where my parents lived. Mm -hmm. So I saw the patients back until they uh, were offloaded at the hospital there, and uh, spent the night with my parents, and next day, uh, caught another uh, civilian flight out of uh, somewhere out of the Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. area, and as we got, I got out to California, there's, a, there's an air base outside of Sacramento, and I forget the name of it. I think that's when the Pueblo uh, got captured by the North Vietnamese. Now, now, I, I may be <laughs> getting the time sequence uh, mm -hmm. wrong here, but it was some incident. I thought, mm -hmm. think it was the Pueblo. And so I was told, Doc, you're going to have to stay here a while because we're sending a lot of forces to South Korea mm -hmm. because we don't know if it's going to yeah. escalate into a big deal or not. I said, okay. So I spent about five days at that Air Force base waiting 
for a flight. So then finally he said, okay, we got a flight for you. So he put me on a flight and I flew to, I think I flew to Elmendorf, Alaska, and then over the North Pole to Saigon. And came into Saigon at about 12 or 1 o'clock in the morning. I was looking out the window as we were descending, and, and I could see uh, tracer fire, automatic weapon tracer fire in the air over Saigon. I thought, that doesn't look good. I wonder what that's all about. So I landed, and they said, Doc, we're going to take you out to the Hotel, to Hotel Annapolis again. And this is 2 o'clock in the morning. I said, I think I'll just sleep here in the um, terminal and uh, catch my flight up to Da Nang in the morning. They said, eh, these are wooden benches. They're not going to be very comfortable. I said, that's okay. I'll just stay here. So I was trying to sleep on a wooden bench, and every 30 seconds or so, I could hear a boom. And I asked one of the military guys, I said, what is that? And he said, that's H&I fire. And I said, what's H&I? And he said, that's harassment and interdiction. And I said, what is that? He said, that means we're just randomly shooting an artillery round out into the jungle to prevent the Viet Cong from congregating into a group that can attack us. And I thought, holy moly, this is going all night long, every 30 seconds or so, one of these things. I thought the expense of that must have been fabulous. So I said, okay. So I was trying to sleep and this artillery fire is going off. And about 4 o'clock in the morning, it gets really noisy. There's a lot of automatic weapons fire and explosions. And they drop in these parachute flares. I, I think artillery could yeah. fire yeah. a flare that would come down. There was a magnesium flare, and it, it would be swinging back and forth as it came down. It cast this very eerie, bright light, and because it was swinging back and forth, the shadows were all shifting. It, it was the most strange and, and threatening thing. And the guys were saying, "VC, you're inside the perimeter," and I thought, and <laughs> first thought that came into my mind was, my mother's going to really be upset if I get killed there. <laughs> that funny how to, your mother, in my case at least, was the first thing that popped into my mind. And, uh, and I mean, you know, there was, I was firing them right around the terminal. And I could see the tracers. And finally, somebody said, um, hey, you guys, um, we're going to put you on a bus and we're going to take you to a more secure part of Tonsonet. But keep down, don't show your head above the windows. <laughs> I thought, well, I don't like the sound of that. <laughs> so they put us on a bus and they sent us out somewhere and all this racket, all this firing going on. And uh, it was some barracks at a place that was more secure. We stayed there. And somebody had a radio, and they said, something big is going on, because they said, this is going on all of South Vietnam. Every provincial capital, every major city was attacked. And it, it was, they were not small attacks either. And um, so I said, oh boy, what am I going to do now? So they said, Here's, uh, a fixed wing aircraft couldn't fly in the Saigon at that time, because they were too low to the ground. So they said, hey, we're going to put you on a chopper. It's going to, chopper is going to fly straight up, and once it gets above range, it'll fly up to, uh, to Da Nang, get on your ship. So, okay, thanks. So, got on with just a pilot, a Huey, I think, and uh, about halfway up, he started coming down like he's going to land. I said, what are we doing? He said, I got to refuel, Doc. Uh, so, there was this landing zone, it had been blasted out of the jungle, there was not a soul around, and there was a gas pump there. <laughs> he landed the chopper and filled it with gas, and we took off and went to Saigon. <laughs> it's the craziest thing I ever saw. Somebody built this thing out there in the jungle so that the choppers could refuel and get around. I would have never considered that. So anyway, he got a little, uh, let me off, and I got to the ship, and he said, where have you been, Bert? I said, well, I got tied up in San Francisco. <laughs> he said, well, we're getting a lot of casualties and get to work. So mm -hmm. 
so that was my one exposure to combat, and I, and I can't say that I saw an enemy combatant or mm -hmm. even saw any bullets hitting around me, but I, it was certainly going on. And and uh, in Saigon, you know, the, the VC got inside the uh, American Embassy, and uh, uh, and especially there's a, a district of Saigon called Cho Lam, which was a Chinese district. There's terrible fighting there for some time. Mm -hmm. Afterwards, very bloody thing. Anyway, that was my one exposure. Okay. So, after that, though, you're getting pretty busy because we there's quite busy. There okay. been, it went on for an extended period, uh, and there were getting things after that. Uh, now, how far into your tour were you at that point? Well, I was there from August to, uh, and I came back in June. Okay. I think I did ten months. So about halfway through. About halfway through. All right. Now, did the business, as it were, uh, stay at about the same level, or did it about things quiet down eventually? Or we, got, we had a lot of casualties. We were very, very busy, and, and it was not unusual for surgeons to go two or three days without, with very little sleep, maybe mm -hmm. a nap at best. And uh, the surgeons were really hard pressed to take care of everybody. And. Uh, you know, theoretically, in, in war, there's a triage concept. The casualties are divided into those who are hopelessly injured. You, you can't mm -hmm. help them, and you give them morphine or whatever to keep them comfortable in, in the expectation they're going to die. There, then there's the group of patients that are wounded but need immediate attention. And then there are the patients that are lightly wounded and, and are going to live and, and can maybe be treated after they're more seriously injured. But I don't think I ever saw a patient that was not treated because his case was thought to be hopeless. They tried mm -hmm. every everyone that I saw, and I saw some some really bad burns that everyone knew was fatal. They they, they just tried to keep them mm -hmm. comfortable, but uh, the, but there are a lot of bad casualties at that time, and and all kind all degrees of seriousness, uh, intermediate and uh, lightly wounded too. So it's a really busy time. It's hard, it's hard for everybody. Mm -hmm. it's just so much. Yeah, I know some of the Marines that I've, I've interviewed talked about, you know, going and finding out they're being sent out to the repose and they heard various stories about how some huge percentage of people, you're sent to the repose because they think you're going to die. Oh, no. You had never heard that. I, I did not hear that. As a matter of fact, uh, you know, with with a few exceptions, uh, the very great majority of the uh, casualties we got did survive. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because they were helicoptered straight mm -hmm. from where they got hurt out. That, that, that was one of the things that was learned from Vietnam was that if you could get them from the time of injury to medical care very quickly, mm -hmm. their chances of survival improved a lot. Yeah. And uh, so that was a big advance in uh, military medical care. Yeah. Well, I expect it's more likely that if you're sent out to the hospital ship, you probably don't rejoin your unit. And so they then would go away and never come back. Well, there were some of that, yeah. A lot of them, uh, if they were really bad, we would stabilize them. They'd go to Japan mm -hmm. and then finally back to uh, either Bethesda or, or I think there's a naval hospital in California, too, mm -hmm. that the Navy guys went to. Yeah. The Marines. Also, actually, Great Lakes in Chicago, I expect they would go to. Uh, yes, there was a hospital there, too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we either treated them, if they were lightly wounded, we'd keep them until they were ready to go yeah. back to duty. Uh, and if they required extensive uh, work and more operations and rehab, then they'd go back to the States. Mm -hmm. So maybe, maybe that was their perception that. Um, because it was part of the military evacuation system that um, when you went to the repose, you had a chance of going back to mm -hmm. the States. All right. All right. Uh, now, did you, aside from that trip to Bethesda, did you get any other breaks from being on the ship? Or? Yes, the, the ship, uh, I would say about every six weeks, every five or six weeks, we go to. Uh, Subic Bay, which uh, was in the Philippines, not too far south of Manila. We had a, a big Navy base there, and uh, and also an Air Force base that later the Filipino government 
decided. Right. Clark Air Force Base. Clark, yeah. right. Actually, Clark got covered up by a Pinatubo yes, uh, uh, eruption. Um, but we go to Subic Bay, and a couple of times they, they had R and R trips. I remember we went to Hong Kong one time. I think that's the only R and R I can remember. We were going to go to uh, Saspo, Japan, where my brother was uh, in the Navy, but um, that got canceled. That might have gotten canceled by the town offensive. Something happened to cancel them. Mm -hmm. So, so we get breaks every five, six weeks. Okay, uh, and I don't know what. Well, I know that was a lot to do at, at, at Subic Bay, and some of it could get men into a lot of trouble. Uh, if you're not going to get into trouble, I mean, what would you do when you went to a base like that? Yeah, very nice golf course, and I like mm -hmm. to I play golf there. <laughs> I enjoyed that being there. Uh, and did you get to go visit Hong Kong at all while you were over there? Did, yes, yes. <coughs> I did, and um, had an interesting experience. Some of the officers knew I played a lot of golf and wanted me to go play golf. <coughs> There's a part of Hong Kong at that time was called the New Territories, which had butted up against uh, the Chinese Communist uh, mm -hmm. property. And we were playing, and, and, and um, just on the other side of a very light fence, uh, some farmers were hoeing, digging, you know, tilling the soil by hand, no tractors or animals or anything. And uh, one of the officers pulled out a camera and was taking pictures of them. This Chinese guy's got really upset and started yelling at Chinese. <laughs> and I, I think he felt that, you know, this was a rich American saying, look at those poor mm -hmm. Chinese dogs, you know, working in the dirt like that. So they were very sensitive about that. And I thought we were going to have a little international <laughs> incident, but they, <coughs> they didn't cross the fence. All right. So. Okay. Now, there's part of why you're, you're here in Grand Rapids at this point to be interviewed is that uh, after the war you became something of a sculptor and you did a sculpture of um, basically a wounded soldier who was actually from this area, it was an actual Marine who was here. Can you explain sort of that story or where that came from? <coughs> During the Tet Offensive, uh, there was a Marine infantryman, rifleman from uh, Grand Rapids named Dennis Labazo who was at Quezon, which is one of our fire bases, very close to the DMZ. It was within artillery range from the northern side of the DMZ. And it was a terrible place to be. A lot of guys got hurt there. And uh, he got hit by mortar fire and was peppered with a bunch of uh, um, shrapnel fragments. But they were, they were, they were not deep and life-threatening. So he was flown out to the ship with a bunch of other guys, and uh, he was assigned to me because, you know, the seriousness was not very great, and I, I was qualified to take care of him. So I dug out all these shrapnel fragments and stitched up the various uh, lacerations and, and followed him until he healed up. And his name stuck with me because I, I Labazo was not a name I'd ever heard mm -hmm. before, and I thought it must be some Dutch name. And I got to know him, and he was a very nice guy. He was very soft-spoken and respectful, and everybody liked him. Just a very nice person. Mm -hmm. And he went back uh, to duty maybe three weeks later or so, maybe four weeks. And I remember uh, thinking, boy, I hope he makes it back home, because he would be terrible if something happened to him. Well, the last day I was in Vietnam, I. I I spent it at the uh, base in Da Nang, and they had a Stars and Stripes newspaper, and it had a list of uh, killed in action and wounded in action, and under the KIA was Dennis Labazo. Yeah, <laughs> that uh, it really hit me. I did not did not want to see that. Mm -hmm. So went back, came back to the States, and, you know, a lot, there were a lot of people that were so opposed to the war that they thought that it was appropriate to show disrespect to the soldiers, as though the soldiers had cooked this thing up, you know, mm -hmm. they, they want to go over there and get shot at. And, uh, and I received a little bit of that, which didn't bother me much, because I, I thought it was pretty stupid, but, uh, but it seemed, uh, a, a, a gross injustice to me that these guys got sent over there exposed to all these illnesses and all these terrible things.
terrible injuries, and then came back and people dishonored them. I, I mean, it, it just seemed so wrong, and I, I was pretty upset about that, but I, I didn't tell anybody that. And, uh, but it was always in the back of my mind, and I thought, you know, maybe someday when I retire, maybe I can do something to counteract that, to say these guys deserve to be honored, not treated like they're uh, war criminals, mm -hmm. which seemed to be the attitude. So I retired fairly early. I was only 58 when I retired and uh, decided to go back to school, started studying art and sculpture. And did that for a few years and uh, thought, well, you know, I think I may be able to do this. So I wanted to make a memorial to Dennis. and. Uh, and I, I made a bronze sculpture of a wounded soldier. And I had a plaque that said to honor and memory of Dennis Labuse. And uh, my wife discovered that there was a, there's a virtual Vietnam Memorial Wall on the internet. And it had his name and it had a lot of stuff about him that I hadn't known. And so I called up his family and uh, talked to him. And then later, when the sculpture was finished, I uh, found out that he had been engaged to marry a, a girl named Den uh, Joyce Slava. Uh, <laughs> oh, I'm getting upset. Anyway, he, he had to marry this girl. So I called her up and I said, look, uh, I want to look for a place in Grand Rapids to put that sculpture. Can you show me around? She said, sure. Okay. I so need to can... pause right here because tape is about up, so rather than cut you off. All right, now you were explaining that you had gotten in, in contact with a woman who today is Joyce Washburn, who had been Dennis Lovato's fiance, and so you're communicating with her. And uh, she said yes, if I uh, came up to uh, Grand Rapids, uh, she would be happy to show me around, maybe try to find a place for the sculpture. Mm -hmm. And we looked at a number of places and weren't happy with them for various reasons, and then finally uh, we, she got in touch with Henry Matthews at Grand Valley State University, and uh, he's a very impressive person. He's got a very strong background in art curation, mm -hmm. curator, as a curator, and uh, um, so uh, he said he would accept it for Grand Valley State University, and they would need to build a, a pedestal for it. Uh, and they built a very nice one, very, very fine one. And they'd find a place for it, which they did, and they accepted it. And uh, so I gave it, I donated it to them early this year, mm -hmm. and uh, tomorrow it will be dedicated. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now to kind of go back into your, your story, back in, into Vietnam, are, um, there's a number of different kinds of, of stereotypes and, and things that get associated with Vietnam and, and people who went there. And some of them aren't relevant because you're on a hospital ship and not in the field or in the community. Um, one of the things that comes up a lot are issues of drug use. When you're on a hospital ship, there's a variety of interesting medications and so forth there. Were there any problems or issues with people using substances they shouldn't have used? If there were, I wasn't aware of it. I, I did. And I, I did not know about drug use in the field. Uh, later on, I met a, a corpsman, a former corpsman, who mm -hmm. said it was pretty rampant, but um, I, I just wasn't aware of it on mm -hmm. the ship. I so it's not what you're seeing, you're not, in, well, the, the era of really bad drug overdoses comes later, because that's when heroin comes in, uh -huh. uh, but that wouldn't have been there when you were there. Uh, and then another issue that comes up that has to do with racial tensions. I mean, were there black crewmen on the ship, or? There were, and, and certainly black uh, combat soldiers, yeah. troops, and uh, again, I, I, I didn't see that, but I, I guess, you know, if you're wounded or sick, and it's probably mm -hmm. less likely that that sort of thing yeah. is going to come out. I, I, I just didn't mm -hmm. see it. But among the ones who crewed on the ship, you didn't have a, a sense of any sort of negative I, attitude or anything like that? I could not recognize that if it was there. I, I, I didn't see it. Okay. Because again, some of the people tend to assume or associate, but doesn't necessarily fit everybody's experience in Vietnam. My, my impression was everybody was under a lot of stress to try to help these guys get everybody taken care of, and evacuated if that needed to be done, and, and uh, it seemed like there was just so much stuff to be doing all the time that uh, just 
didn't seem like there yeah. was much time for those kinds of issues, yeah. but, but I, I may have been blind to some things that were going on. That's just what it is. But I expect that usually the most worst problems happen when people have too much time on their hands. So yeah. that's not your, your issue. Okay. Now you did have female nurses on, on the ship, and was that, was that kind of a relatively new thing as far as you could tell? or? I think, I, I'm not aware that in Korea or Second World War that there were women nurses actually in combat situation, or near, close to combat. I, as far as I knew, it was the, the first time that it had been done. Okay. And did that create sort of morale or discipline issues at times? Uh, my perception was that it did, because you had a lot of, uh, there were 29 female nurses in a ship with about 600 men, crew, and patients. Young, healthy men mm -hmm. who had been away from women a long time. They were scared and they were lonely. And inevitably, I think it's inevitable that uh, liaisons developed between mm -hmm. the nurses and the men. I, I think it's just human nature for that to happen. And if uh, one couple would break up, the, the man would be upset about it. And, and there was a lot of that. And I thought it was not conducive to good morale. And, and it dawned on me, there, there used to be this uh, sort of sexist uh, idea that uh, a woman on ship is bad luck for the ship. It began to seem to me that there was a reason for people saying that because the guys who didn't enjoy the company of the woman were jealous of it and didn't like it. So uh, the impression I had was that it caused problems. Now they were very good nurses, they were very dedicated nurses, and I think those nurses would have, well they did extend themselves in every way to help the, the patients. but. Um, I, I left that ship thinking, this is an experiment that's not, that, that, that comes with a lot of baggage and problems, and I, I don't think it's a good idea. But of course, the military's come a very long way since mm -hmm. then in, in integrating women into the, the military and gone way beyond that. And uh, it would be interesting to me to talk to both uh, men and women in the military now and see, see what their perception of it is because I, I think there, there still are issues of um, having uh, men and women in close proximity under a great deal of stress. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah, and ultimately as far as the, the results are, are, are mixed, there's a variety of things that go on. I mean, on the whole, the military is probably better off with them for a lot of different reasons for the skill sets they bring and the rest, right. but it's not like the, the other older issues entirely go away either. And that's kind of what I get with the younger veterans, male and female, for what they'll tell me. Right. I, I have the impression that the Israeli military has uh, had women in combat uh, yeah. for yeah. a very long time, mm -hmm. and they may have uh, worked out these issues and, and found a way to make it work. I'm, I'm not sure. It, it's a problem that uh, is interesting to me, and I, and I hope that uh, women are never excluded merely because they're women. I, I mm -hmm. would be wrong. But um, but there there were some problems associated right. with. Okay. Now, are there other events or aspects of your, your time on the repose that kind of stand out in your memory that you haven't brought into the story here yet? Um, we had uh, we had a rash of terrible burn patients, terribly burned patients, that were sent out. I, I don't know why they all they all seem to come within a few weeks or months of each other. Um, in order to transport combat troops to an area, sometimes they were put in a, an armored personnel carrier, APC, mm -hmm. to protect them against uh, rifle fire, I guess. And apparently they had a fuel bladder under underneath the personnel compartment, or near the mm -hmm. personnel compartment, so that if the APC got hit by a, a rocket-propelled grenade in such a way that it ruptured the fuel bladder and the compartment that the men were in. 
the fuel would be ignited and they'd be sitting in a bath of burning gasoline. And uh, those guys would get sent out to us, and I'm sure Da Nang took care of a lot of them too, and some of them had 100% burns, and I don't mean like sunburn, I mean through the full thickness mm -hmm. of their skin. And there was no possibility that they could survive that. And then there would be 90% burns, 80% burns, 70% burns that uh, all were essentially a death sentence. Mm -hmm. And we would take them to the operating room and, and uh, the ones that we thought might have a little chance or any chance at all to survive, we would cut off all the burned uh, tissue which amounted to skinning them. Mm -hmm. And it, it was such a ghastly thing to see these poor guys. And, uh, and the thing that was very difficult was that some of them they didn't seem to have much pain. They seemed to uh, be comfortable and um, not aware that that they were not going to survive this. Or, or if they were, they weren't talking about it. And uh, I remember there was an army captain came in. He had essentially 100% burns. And uh, he was on a stretcher and uh, talking to the nurses. He said, this is not going to beat me. My wife just had a baby. I've got something to live for. And I said, oh, that's great, that's great. And uh, uh, he asked for a drink of water. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's okay. Pause here for a moment. And he asked for a drink of water, and the nurse gave him a cup of water. And he thanked her, and he uh, laid back on the stretcher and he died. Mm -hmm. Just like that, didn't seem to have any pain, didn't have any uh, inkling that it was coming, he just died. So how did the medical personnel, I mean, you're seeing this kind of thing on a regular basis, how did you deal with that or stay focused? I think that... Uh, I think there's a, a natural protective mechanism where d doctors are, uh, try to keep a little bit of a distance mm -hmm. because if you got close to everybody like that, you, you couldn't survive yourself. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, later when you think about it, you think, you know, what, a, what an awful thing that was. It's, uh, and I think that I, I probably was not very good at that. I. Uh, you know, from early in childhood, I, I was afraid of that kind of thing happening to me, and uh, maybe I uh, wasn't very good at keeping a distance. Um, but I, I think that doctors have to do that because uh, if you get uh, too close too many times, you, you just can't do it. Mm -hmm. You can't keep going. So uh, the other doctors, and uh, I know everybody felt bad about those things, but. Uh, at least it seemed that at least they could uh, deal with it. They mm -hmm. I, I only saw one doctor openly uh, weeping on the ship in the time I was there. Mm -hmm. And there were plenty of reasons right. for it. So I, I, guess, uh, I guess that's how humans are made. They try to uh, not get too connected. Well, the same thing would happen to the soldiers in the field if you were in the combat units. Yeah. You'd kind of learn not to make too many friends because you didn't want to bury them. Uh, yeah, I had, I had heard that, that um, the, the more experienced soldiers, when, when new guys were coming online, uh, didn't want to get real close to them. Mm -hmm. So, uh, part of war, I mm -hmm. guess. But, it, uh, obviously still. Sure. Has an effect. Now, are, as you were kind of getting close to, to the end, of, you know, did you know exactly when you were scheduled to leave, or did you leave earlier than you were supposed to? Or? No, I knew to the day. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody, <laughs> everybody knew to the day when they were going to get out of there and go back to the world. <laughs> and uh, I knew when I was going back. Okay. Uh, and so, what's the process then for you? Your day comes. What happens? 
Well, they gave me a little plaque saying I had served on the USS Repose, which I still have and value. And um, I think, you know, everybody gets together and have a piece of cake and a little minor celebration. And then uh, I guess I got off the ship at Da Nang and I, I had to spend the night uh, at uh, some ba some bachelor's office or some quarters there at the base, and I remember thinking, uh, and Da Nang used to get rocketed pretty often. Uh, I remember thinking, oh, just let me get through this night, and I'm, I'm home free. <laughs> but it was that night that I saw that uh, KIA list with mm -hmm. Dennis's name on it. Yeah. And then from Da Nang, where do you go? They flew me back to Edwards Air Force Base in uh, outside of Washington D.C. and uh, they just they'd have me report for duty and say you can go home. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think I was there maybe ten days or two weeks and then then separated. Okay, because you had spent enough time already out of the Mediterranean. The rest that your two hour your two years were just about up by the time you got back. Yes. Okay. Yeah, they timed it so. Yeah. That, uh, okay. When, now, did you fly out of Da Nang, or did you go someplace else first and then leave? Flew out of Da Nang, and uh, I think on the way back, it seemed like I stopped at Tokyo. That's quite possible. And they took me, Tokyo must be a gigantic city, they put me on a car and took me, it seemed like, a hundred miles, of course it wasn't that long, to some American base mm -hmm. and they took me to a room that probably had 500 empty hospital beds in it and he said, pick your, pick your bed. <laughs> and I slept in that vast mm -hmm. ward and I said, what is this? And they said, well, you know, Korea is just across the straits there and if it breaks loose and you get a lot of casualties, they're going to go, or, or from Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So they, they had um, very large facilities in case of large numbers of casualties, mm -hmm. but it wasn't being used. Just used for one dock to sleep in mm -hmm. <laughs> at night. But it was, again, it was astounding. The, the military has such gigantic facilities and so much material. Mm -hmm. it, it's. Uh, it seems almost unreal how much is devoted to it. Well, they had a price tag to it. It did. Up with us eventually. Uh, now, okay, so you get back, and so you're discharged pretty quickly. Now, do you go back to medical residency at this point, or do you go to George Washington and take up them up on their offer for the neurosurgery uh, thing? Or well, what happens? yes, I, I had agreed that I would do that. Well, I said if uh, I'm not sure I really want to be around those neurosurgeons mm -hmm. <laughs> who can be pretty grumpy sometimes. So I said. I'll try it, but if I'm not happy with it, I reserve the right to quit. Mm -hmm. And they said, okay, that's all right, that's fair enough. So I had to do a year of general surgery to qualify for the neurosurgery. I did that at the Washington VA Hospital. I was a year there doing general surgery, and then I began uh, neurosurgery at George Washington University and its affiliated hospitals. Okay. And now, then, did you stay in Washington a long time, or did you move and set up a practice somewhere else, or? I moved to Hagerstown, Maryland, which is about 70 miles outside of Washington, and was in private practice there for 25 years, and then retired. All right. Uh, and then from there, you kind of started to study art and develop other uh, kinds of interests. And yes, I moved to uh, South Carolina, where my wife's parents were having some medical problems. Mm -hmm. and, uh, moved down there and uh, started school there in, in Charleston, South Carolina. And I still take uh, classes there. I got a degree in, medic in uh, uh, art history mm -hmm. and a degree in studio art, which is the study of painting, and sculpture, mm -hmm. and printmaking, and so forth. So I got two degrees after okay. retiring. Now, um, before the interview, you said something to me about how you thought kind of the, your, your, your time in, in, in the service or whatever wound up sort of changing your life or direction of your life or something like that. Uh, what effect did it have on you to have gone into the service? Well, first of all, um, I had no intention whatsoever of going into any surgical specialty, so when Dr. Ammerman learned that I was 
back in the States between my two years of duty, uh, apparently he took it into his mind to, to recruit me to go into neurosurgery mm -hmm. and, uh, and being a persuasive guy, uh, talked me into going to get some exposure to it in Vietnam and see if I thought it was interesting and then uh, and do it. So, so I became a neurosurgeon basically mm -hmm. because of that opportunity for to go to the hospital ship and uh, and also um, the Navy is very good all the military branches are probably very good about having very well defined duties your duty is this and that duty is that guy's and and there's a hierarchical structure you're responsible to that, and, and if you got a problem, you don't go over your senior's head, you go to him, and then he goes to the next mm -hmm. guy. That's a very important idea in the military, and um, I, I came to see that there were good reasons for that, and uh, going over your superior's head makes him look bad, and mm -hmm. it's not, not a good thing, and it's not fair to him either. He never gets a chance to deal with the problem. But uh, I noticed that after uh, in training and later, a lot of uh, doctors coming out of training that, that never had any military exposure, th those ideas were, were not there, and they're they're freewheeling it, and they don't feel they don't seem to feel as strong an obligation to the to the unit, to the particular group of people that you're working with. They, um, I think there's less of a uh, uh, esprit de corps or community spirit. I, I don't want to make it sound like they're not civic-minded or anything like that, but it's just different. Yeah. They, they don't seem to have this sense that uh, the guys above you need to be let in on what's going on. Mm -hmm. for them. Well, they kind of a lot of them may be kind of self-absorbed sorts of individuals themselves and having been in, in the military you get, get a more maybe sophisticated kind of view of how things actually work. Yeah, I think that's very well put. I, I think that's what it amounts to. And I was the same way before I was in the military. I, I wasn't worrying about who, who's the next in command. and I, I just didn't think like that. Mm -hmm. I, why would I? I? never had been exposed to it. Uh, so I think it was I think it was good for me. I, I think I grew up a lot. I saw a lot of, a lot of tough things to deal with, and uh, found out that the world, the world doesn't care that much about you. <laughs> You're, you, you better make it on your own because people aren't going to go out their way that much to, to help you. I mean, of course your parents love you and love do, but it, it can be a tough yeah. world. There's a, a lot of stuff that happens. It seems random. And then, very impersonal. Right. So you do a certain kind of growing up in that process. I think I did. It was good for me. I needed it. I needed it. And, uh, All right. Well, I tell you, it makes for very good stories. So I just like to, to close by thanking you for sharing it with me today. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate the opportunity.